Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the program, a rebroadcast of one of our most popular interviews with musician and philanthropist and critic of foundations, Peter Buffett. At the end of another year, we look back at some of the program's highlights and we get a sneak peek at a documentary in progress about the lives of women and girls of color in plain sight. What to make of the following? Philanthropy is enjoying a heyday. The nonprofit sector has never given away more, 316 billion in 2012, according to the Urban Institute. Meanwhile, governments in crisis and basic human services are being cut. Grid TV guest Peter Buffett thinks a lot about these topics. He's a musician and composer, but yes, he's also the son of Warren Buffett. With his wife, he heads up a foundation. But in July, he penned an op-ed with the provocative title, The Charitable Industrial Complex. And he wrote, as more lives and communities are destroyed by the system that creates vast amounts of wealth for the few, the more heroic it sounds to give back. It's what I would call conscience laundering. And that's why I wanted him and I to talk. Buffett's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Life is what you make it. So welcome to Grit TV. Thank you so much. Great to be here. So I've called it philanthro-feudalism, but I like this uh, <laughs> charitable industrial complex. Thank what you. do you mean by it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's a uh, system like so many others that have sort of, uh, I guess it's grown too big for its britches or something. <laughs> and I will say britches because it's mostly men. Um, but uh, it, it really seems like it's sort of folding in on itself and, you know, keeping itself alive as opposed to trying to put itself out of business, uh, you know, much like the military industrial complex. So all this charitable giving isn't making any difference? Well, I would say that on, uh, you know, philanthropy, first of all, means the love of people, right? So it has nothing to do with money. So on the personal scale, on the relationship side, on the community side, there's plenty of good happening and certainly plenty of well-meaning people. But as it gets into larger sums, uh, bigger egos, <laughs> uh, bigger rooms with more people in them. Uh, it starts to disconnect itself, I think, from the very issues it's it's, it's supposedly solving or helping or whatever. All right, yeah. so let's just pull back just a second and talk about how you got into this <laughs> mess. mess. <laughs> <laughs> you That's it. It, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, just to recap, I mean, it says on the back of the book, um, the only thing, the only inheritance you really got from your father was a philosophy. Now, is right. that really true? Well, believe it or not, it it is, it was. So, first of all, I'd like to say that I just recently became Warren Buffett's son, right? Because <laughs> nobody cared, nobody knew. Uh, the last decade has been different for me. Uh, growing up in Omaha, the house I grew up in, uh, he still lives in to this day, uh, drives himself to the same office uh, that he did in 1963. Uh, I went to the uh, same schools my mother did, went to public school all the way through, had the same English teacher my mother had in high school, so very Midwestern upbringing. Nobody did know, including me, uh, what my dad did or that there was vast amounts of money piling up. We still don't really know. No, we still don't. I, I, that's true. It's, it's, a, it's a mystery, but he must be good at it, right? And I remember my dad literally saying, if your passion is collecting garbage, go for it. I will not love you any less than if you are a doctor. Now that's incredibly liberating and he meant it. You know, that's the other thing. I knew he wasn't just paying lip service to this or to the idea that you should find something you love. That's all I saw was that he loved what he did. Went off to college. My grandfather ended up, I learned when I was 19, leaving us uh, he left us a farm that my father sold, uh, and I got $90,000 of Berkshire Hathaway stock. And with that money, uh, I did what I thought was the smartest investment. I invested in myself. Yeah, you write about it. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, and gave myself time to learn my craft, which was music making, and uh, went on and built my career and all that. Um, yes, there were lots of, of privileges, but it was really the privilege of having the parents I had. All right, so there was the 90,000 when you were 19, but then in 1999, your father starts a foundation for each of his children, and right. you're, you're one of them. Yep. And that foundation at that point, I think you say, had $10 million. That's right. The big headline came in 2006, when right. suddenly those foundations received an injection of $1 billion right. as one 
billion with a B. Right, with a B. <laughs> as your father started distributing his his uh, much of his of his fortune. Yeah. Um, talk about that and how you thought about being quote unquote a philanthropist because by that point after a lot of effort you were actually pretty happy in the music I was world quite happy you yeah, sort of exactly. found your identity <laughs> yep, um, yep and then suddenly you're dealing with money again right yeah thanks a lot right <laughs> and and it was this huge responsibility huge opportunity great show of trust of course of my dad leaving myself and my brother and sister all a billion dollars to to do something with charitably um, but Thank God Jennifer, my wife, was also as passionate as I was about it because I was happy in, in my music career and I didn't know what this would do to it. But we had just recently moved to New York and what we knew is it was a fantastic place to be to learn. And we spent a couple of years after 2006 really listening to a lot of people and, and probably a hundred and some people came through the office in those two years. and. It was a master class in, in the givers and the getters. You know, what's going on, who's giving and why, how do they behave, all that. And, and so that was really what we did first, is try and learn as much as we could. And that's what you argued in your op-ed, that we need to have philanthropy doing a better job of listening. Absolutely. What's going wrong? Well, you know, I, I, I sort of hate to say it's wrong, misguided, you know, off the tracks a little, but not because there aren't well-meaning people, but it's because you get caught up. You know, one thing, for instance, is I say that when you have a billion dollar foundation, you're better looking, your jokes are funnier, you're invited ever. So you start to get into this funhouse mirror world and you can't get to the truth as easily because the money creates a dynamic that is really disastrous for real learning and uh, so what happens also is that you know people what's better than purpose in a paycheck right I mean you're out there doing good and you're making a living and that feels good but you certainly don't get up in the morning saying how can I lose my job and that's what you should be doing and so there's all these kind of built-in mechanisms around the money not creating an honest dialogue um, the feeling that you're doing something good in the world and and paying for food on the table makes you feel good and and you don't really want that to end you know poverty uh, hunger the environment education health all those things are I see them as symptoms of this larger problem of nobody really wanting to get in there and blow some things up. I mean, let's be clear, the there is a relationship between the problems that government's facing and the amount of money in philanthropic circles. I saw a piece the other day about Mark Zuckerberg of, of Facebook, mm -hmm. considering how to spend his $26 billion, <laughs> uh, and he wants to put it into education. Right. And the biggest amount of money going into education is coming from us, $526 billion every year from taxpayers wow, right. just for pre-k right isn't government really the most important engine of this stuff and if the accumulation of wealth is at the cost of being able to fund government isn't that really where we have to start that's a tough nut to crack because of course then if philanthropic dollars come in then government says oh maybe we don't have to worry about this so much and then they're not doing their job because as you're saying they should be the ones doing it and then at the same time you've got people with vast amounts of money controlling government ultimately too so you've got this thing that circles around where you've got all sorts of money in government you've got all sorts of money doing what government should be doing and and people saying to government pay attention to this as opposed to that and and then you've got an education system in particular that is based on a, an agrarian slash industrial model that's 150 years old that shouldn't be what it is now anyway. I mean, obviously, technology is slowly shifting that, and I think education 50 years from now will look very different than it does now. But you're, it gets back to this reform issue around who's responsible and, and, and how do you create the mechanisms to really make it happen? Because, yeah, charitable dollars not only are throwing money into education, but then saying, oh, that didn't work so well, I'll leave. You know, and then you've got this huge hole that they've created in terms of methodology and uh, yeah but didn't we create a system when we created graduated income tax and you have governments that are elected with accountability to the people that decide how some of this money is spent the philanthropists today want to not pay taxes right and shelter their money but then well control government as go you said and through campaign yeah, contributions yeah yeah and then play with it with charitable contributions and yeah the whole it, um, it's a mess, yeah, and, and it all comes down to you know the money flow and how important 
the importance we place on that. And of course, being my father's son, that's such a fun area to get into. And I'm, you know, there's plenty of people smarter than I am in terms of alternatives, which is some of what we find at Novo. Like, how else can we look at money flow and 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 the money role plays in our society? Because uh, it's it's distorted beyond belief. We all know that. And it's how, how do you correct those distortions? Your father's spoken up for more taxation. Tax reform. A little bit more. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah. And he's made the point of yep. the unfairness of our current tax burdens. Yep. Um, but isn't that really the point? I mean, Lewis Brandeis wrote at the beginning of the century, the Supreme Court justice last century, that you can either have this sort of concentration of extreme wealth or democracy. You can't have both. Right. And isn't our situation directly related to the fact that these fortunes have been amassed? Isn't the amassing really kind of the problem? Well, yeah. I mean, I think Ralph Nader said if we had more justice, there'd be less charity, yeah. right? And that's another way of saying the same thing is that if, and that's why in the op-ed I said I'm not calling for an end to capitalism, I'm calling for humanism. Well, if you really call for humanism, you are calling for That's what I thought capitalism. when I read it. <laughs> I know. But I tried to kind of like get around that a little bit to raise the issue and say, well, what do you mean and don't you mean that? You know, I wanted to get people talking about that spot because our system, I mean, you can't have unlimited growth. You can't have, you know, the, the concept of return on investment. A lot of these definitions have to be redefined. I mean, they have to be changed so that a return is something other than you know, whatever the percentage it might be or whatever the monetary return might be. I mean, we, we have to really look at how we're naming things and the, the system we're in. Are you and Jennifer going to spend this foundation down? Definitely. Before yeah. you, in your lifetime? Yeah, absolutely. We're big believers that the, the money is for now. You know, it's not to create some legacy. It's not to have generations, you know, who knows what they would do with it. Not that I don't trust the next generation, but why wait? You know, there's plenty to do, and we want to get it done now. So having said all this, can I get a big check? No, yeah, right, kidding. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Buffett, thank you so much. It's Absolutely. great talking with you. Thank you so much for Peter having Buffett's me. Peter Buffett's the author of Life is What You Make It, and he, with his wife Jennifer, directs the Novo Foundation. Uh, basically began with the observation that the common sense conversation that we've been having in communities of color, the common sense conversation that says men and boys are the primary object of racism, women and girls are doing okay. Women and girls don't need any particular intervention. Women and girls don't need studies, they don't need resources, they don't need programs. So how are we going to work together to make sure that girls and women do not have to wait for the attention they deserve. Well, one of the ways we do it is we don't wait to start talking. We don't wait to get an invitation from the White House or from the caucus to come and tell our stories. We can create spaces to tell our stories. We can find commissioners to hear the stories. We can find experts who have experienced the stories. We can find young women who embody those stories and have overcome them. We can do that ourselves. So that's what we've started to do. You didn't come here for a show. If you did, you're in the wrong place. You came here for real life and for real strategies for change, for systemic change. Well, you have some educators here who are generously offering education and for you to learn from girls of color and their experiences. As recently as October 2nd, when I got arrested with or 12 other people as a part of the Ferguson 13. Nine of us were women, four of us were men that were out 
and got arrested just for speaking up, just for chanting, this is what democracy looks like. Nine of us were women. And then as we moved on and we realized that there was work to be done, we started to try to get around the organizing tables. So we formed you know, my organization, Molina Activist United, which is entirely women. And we realized that that door wasn't so open. The door to the street was wide open. They were willing, you know, and I say they as a community, were willing to have us sacrifice our bodies, were willing to have us sacrifice our lives. I never got pulled off the front line as a woman, but at the table, that door was closed. The way God taught us to be was not to dress in girl clothes, so I was locked in an attic. I remember being locked in the attic for two weeks, and she would come and like slide bread underneath the door, and she would say, you're going to learn that as long as you think you're an animal and want to appear in the streets, this is how we treat you. And that day was my redefining moment. I put all my clothes in a suitcase. We lived in a three-story home. I tied all my bed sheets, and I said, this is it. And I jumped out the window, and I remember hitting the floor, but when I hit that floor, I felt so free free of pain, free of neglect, and free of shame, because I refused to live in that. And oftentimes, a lot of the people who said they loved me, they didn't understand me. So how can you love someone who you don't understand? Rapes of Native women and girls are so high upon my tribal lands that during a group discussion with young girls, the question was asked, what would you do if you were raped? A young Native girl stood up and said, well, my mom and I already talked about that, that when I'm raped, we won't report it because we know nothing will happen and we don't want to cause problems for our family. Mm -hmm. The reality of this 14-year-old girl wasn't a matter of if she's raped, when. but when. You know, and criminalization is held between all of us. Women, we get beat for no reason. I was raped when I was nine years old. Nobody was there when I was raped. Nobody helped me. And when I went to the cops, they did nothing. The man is still running the streets. I don't, I don't see why the justice system has, you, you let rapists and you let people that hurt children out on the streets. A guy killed my brother when I was 15, about seven years ago, and they released him. They acquitted him after five years of being in jail. You let killers and rapists on the streets, but you enslaved young people when a lady shot off warning shots in Florida for 25 years. I didn't want to view it as a racial issue. I didn't want to until I followed some cases down the road a couple of months later. A white woman went to go buy drugs from the projects. She got thrown from a window. The city paid her an enormous amount of money, made sure she was taken care of. She's still living to this day. A little while later, a woman's dog got shot by the police. They immediately fired the police officer. Immediately gave her, compensated her, they said their apologies. You want to know what they said to me? Well, you close your eyes and you will see exactly what they said to me. Nothing. I went down to the mayor's office. We rallied. They wanted to get us arrested. The superintendent of the police, he said the shooting was justified. How is the murder of a young black woman justified it's not. that it's innocent? You tell me what the justice is in that. We went to trial, four of us went to trial, me, um, Venice Brown, Renata Hill, Terrain Dandridge. We went to trial. Um, before trial, they kept a lot of evidence out of trial. They wouldn't allow us to talk about our backgrounds from um, some of us being raped to police brutality, police harassment, um, men harassments, they wouldn't allow us to talk about it and, and try to justify why we reacted the way we reacted. The media dehumanized us. They called us vultures, a wolf pack of lesbians. Um, we, we had no chance. We was found guilty before we even went to trial. And one thing I wanted to talk about today, you know, is thinking about in all the story, really powerful stories and testimonies we've heard that oftentimes women, in addition to doing these things, are responsible for caretaking, right? So, you know, while we're being harassed by those construction workers, yeah. we're walking home, rushing home often to feed our brothers and sisters that we're, we're responsible for, right? So while we're dealing with being immigrants, 
xenophobia, the oppression that comes along with maybe being undocumented, we're also running with our mothers to the doctor's office to be translators. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? So while young moms are dealing with being young moms, we're also cleaning up beer bottles maybe from our uncle, mm -hmm. making sure people are coming in safe at night. And this often adds, you know, undue pressure in our own lives, right? Potentially, you know, pushing us out of school, forcing us to get, you know, jobs, second, third jobs, working late into the night while we're still responsible for caretaking. I spent a big part of the summer interviewing a black woman in my family for this book I'm working on, on familial relationships with trauma, sexual violence, language, and food. I never heard the words rape or sexual violence or sexual assault in my house as a child, though I saw the effects of it on the faces of my mother and my aunties. So I asked my grandmother directly about her experience with rape and sexual violence. My grandma was in a wheelchair now, so she had me wheel her around to the side of the house. There she, I kneeled down and my grandmama told me a story about the white foreman at her job and what he did to her. Mm -hmm. She told me a story about the white man who owned the house she cleaned and what he did to her. Mm -hmm. She told me a story about her black father and what he did to her. She told me a story about her black uncle and what he did to her. She told me stories about the white, black, and Mexican men who worked on the line at her chicken plant and what they did to her. She told me stories about the deacons at the church, men we all looked up to and what they did to her. Mm -hmm. mm. And finally, she told me stories about what her husband, my grandfather, did to her. Mm. Mm. And when she stopped talking, she forced a fake smile and she rubbed my back and she told me, I'm okay, Key, mm. I'm okay. Mm. Mm. For the first time in my life, I took my grandmama's hand off my back, I held it and I told her, no, you're not. Mm. I loved, I told her I love you so much, grandmama but I know you're not okay. Black girls like black boys scar. Black women like black men scar. Wow. And the national negligence and communal lack of love are responsible for that scarring. We can't do anything going forward until we reckon with the cause, shape, and neglect of those scars because those scars are real and we are responsible. Each week on The Laura Flanders Show, best-selling author and broadcaster Laura Flanders sits down with the smartest thinkers and doers of our time, forward-thinking people you know, and others you'll want to know. The good news is this economic system is failing us on so many other fronts. Our responsibility is to be storytellers, and why aren't we telling the stories that are educating the masses? Gandhi believed in racial segregation. This is a very racist society. The discrimination and injustice that we face um, every day. Laura's interested in what's going wrong and also what's going right. Meet the people and movements with grit who are pioneering new economies and better ways of living and find out what stands in their way. But we've got to have a new way of doing politics yep. uh, and I think it's a time for invention yep. uh, and experimentation. And of course experimentation means you often get things wrong. And embrace that notion that there will be failure. The Laura Flanders Show includes exclusive investigative reporting. Don't shoot! We got Eric Garner who was choked to death um, in New York City. We got John Crawford who was picking up a BB gun and shot and killed in Ohio. We got Ezel Ford shot three times in the back in LA. On November 22nd, they unanimously passed our ban. And we became the first tribe in the United States to ban fracking. There's not enough um, housing or classes or schooling for these people to make it. Anyone who wants to do anti-trafficking work needs to really roll up their sleeves and start doing anti-poverty work. And every week, Laura's provocative commentary. What if after 400,000 people marched through Manhattan demanding climate justice, those protesters hadn't dispersed? What if instead of hopping on buses and piling onto highways, those protesters had refused to go home? The Laura Flanders Show builds community, online and in person too through live events such as the State of Female Justice and the Arts and Politics series, Risky Talking. Ready, set, go! <laughs> that really scares me, the idea that there's a news cycle, and the news cycle determines whether an issue is relevant or not. How to start to build a really healthy, robust moral imagination. None of this would be possible without our viewers and supporters. The Laura Flanders Show is not underwritten by corporations or funded by the government. If you think the future relies on media that's forward-thinking, positive, and goes beyond a soundbite, become a monthly subscriber and we'll reserve your seat 
at our next event. Making progress and making community as a new civil rights movement builds in the streets. We revisit a conversation with filmmaker Yoruba Richin about gay rights organizing in the black community. Let's be clear. This is the unfinished business of black people being free. There are great organizations that are connecting LGBT rights and economic equality. Like, those need to be connected. And we hear from author Sarah Schulman. There's nothing that proves that racial supremacy is justified. Ready, set, go! <laughs> Welcome to Risky Talking. <laughs> I'm afraid almost all the time. Mm -hmm. But... But it doesn't stop you. No. And that's a discipline, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Me too. You too? Yes. That really scares me, the idea that there's a news cycle, and the news cycle determines whether an issue is relevant or not.